psychedelics have been used for centuries in rituals or for therapeutic purposes, especially by shamans who are well acquainted with nature and with some of the therapeutic effects of plants and mushrooms. The use of psychedelics induces changes in perception and emotions that can be presented in the form of sensory changes or hallucinations. Despite a popular use during the 60s and 70s, the prohibition of psychedelics in the early 70s restrained research on their effects and their use as potential medical therapies. In the last couple of years, however, there has been a true renaissance in the field and the use of psychedelics has been proposed to be effective in a variety of psychotic disorders, such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, addiction, and so on. And several clinical studies are actually ongoing in this field. And this in the next videos, I would like to review some of the classic psychedelics that act predominantly on the 5-HL2A receptor. These include mescaline, lysergic acid diethylamide, also called LSD, psilocybin and dimethyltryptamine, also referred to as DMT or ayahuasca. In this video, I would like to start with mescaline, which unfortunately has not been studied so extensively compared to other psychedelics, although it has a very rich history. Mescaline is exceptional among the classic psychedelics because of its outstandingly long record of use. The highest proportion of naturally occurring mescaline is found in the North American cactus Lophophora williamsi, also called peyote, which in dried form contains 3-6% of the alkaloid mescaline. The psychoactive alkaloids are concentrated mainly in the parts growing above the soil. These parts are called buttons and they are the preferred form of ingestion by Native Americans. What is quite fascinating is that mescal buttons have been retrieved from excavations at two archaeological sites, one from the so-called Shumla Caves in southwest Texas and one from shelter CM79 in Coahuila, Mexico. Scientists determined the radiocarbon ages of these peyote samples and determined them to be roughly 5,200 and 800 years old. Another research group was even able to extract mescaline from these samples. These findings strengthened evidence that Native Americans recognized the psychoactive properties of peyote already roughly 6,000 years ago. The other major natural source of mescaline is the South American San Pedro cactus. Also here, the historic use is documented through steel and ceramic vessels of the shaving cultures, a pre-Columbian civilization from the northern islands of Peru, dating back 2,500 years. The isolation and chemical characterization of mescaline is really a fascinating story. And the key figure here is the German chemist and pharmacologist Arthur Karl Wilhelm Hefter, who at the end of the 19th century was a professor at the University of Leipzig. Now, in order to understand the chain of the events that ultimately led to the discovery of mescaline by Hefter, I really dug deep into the original literature, and I must say I found it super confusing at first, since back then different names were used for different types of cactus, and especially the Lophophora genus was the subject of significant taxonomic confusion. In any case, Arthur Hefter himself wanted to better understand the compound the components of the different types of cactus, so he analyzed all the cactus samples that were provided to him by different researchers to find out what the real peyote was. Now, in 1894, he started off analyzing samples from Anhalonium fissuratum. You can actually see a drawing of the plant that he used, from which he had quite some amount. Nowadays, we know that Anhalonium fissuratum is false peyote and it does not contain mescaline. And this was confirmed by Hefter, who isolated an alkaloid from this cactus that he called Anhaline. Unfortunately, Hefter's empirical formula for Anhaline was wrong. And 12 years later, in 1906, um, a chemist called Leger independently isolated the same alkaloid but called it Hordenin. It was only and Späth, and I will come to that later, who showed that anhaline and tordinine were identical, and he also proposed a correct molecular structure. In the same paper, Hefter also described another cactus that then in that time was called Anhalonium williamsi, nowadays called Lophophora diffusa, from which he isolated an alkaloid that he named pelotin. Interestingly, also for pelotin, Hefter originally assigned the wrong chemical formula but corrected it in a subsequent paper. It turns out that Hefter also had some real peyote at hand, but due to the scarcity of the raw material and the isolated alcohol that he was able to obtain, he was not able to do a thorough analysis. Now in 1896, Hefter made a decisive breakthrough when the company Park Davis donated 1.37 kilogram 
of real peyote to Hefter. With the material shortages being solved, Hefter now isolated and assigned the correct chemical formula for four different novel alkaloids, three tetrahydroisoquinolins that he called anhalonidine, anhalonine, and lorphophorin, and the fourth one, the phenylethylamine, mescaline. At the time of the isolation, Hefter probably did not realize that he had finally isolated the long sought for philosopher's stone. The fact that he had discovered the magic quintessence of the peyote cactus would only be proven in the course of a whole series of self experiments that he documented in his 1898 paper. Now, this paper from today's viewpoint can actually be regarded as a true classic in psychopharmacology. Hefter investigated the behavioral effects of the various alkaloids that he had isolated from the different cactus in a variety of animals, including frogs, cats, rabbits, and dogs. He started off with pelotine, and this nice graph here that I took from a really cool review on the alkaloids from false peyote, you can actually see the reference at the bottom. Uh, this shows you how detailed the, he investigated the pharmacological effects um, of the different alkaloids. In any case, after having conducted extensive animal testing, Hefter finally took pelotine himself, and he reported that pelotine was devoid of any hallucinogenic properties, but showed noticeable sleep-inducing effects at 50 to 240 mg per os, so after oral administration. Interestingly, Hefter's reports on the sleep-inducing properties of pelotine in humans prompted others to investigate the compound in a clinical setting. I don't want to go into the details here, um, but in the subsequent decades, pelotine was tested in dozens of humans, eventually even in kids. In 1934, um, Krüger tested pelotine in 75 children aged up to 12 years old, and she reported pelotine to be, quote unquote, well tolerated sleeping aid, lacking any immediate toxic effects, and that this compound could lead to a valuable sleeping aid for children. Uh, I, to be honest, find it still a bit crazy, but what I found quite interesting is that the material in, for the clinical studies was provided by Böhringer Waldhof. Since I was not aware of Böhringer Waldhof, but only of Böhringer Engelheim, I dug a bit deeper and found that C.F. Böhringer and Sohne had a site in Waldhof, which eventually became uh, Böhringer Mannheim and is nowadays, of course, part of Roche. Anyways, coming back to mescaline, after having isolated the major alkaloids from peyote, he now wanted to single out the specific alkaloids responsible for the psychoactive effects. Now to that end, Hefter thought it necessary to get a first-hand experience of the effects of the cactus as a whole. So in 1897, he ingested mescal buttons and he experienced quite an intense trip. Uh, he described wonderful color apparitions visions of the beaches of Nervi, so in Italy, where he uh, took some vacation <laughs> many years ago, and the loss of sense of time. Now, being a chemist, he next tried the resinous substance, which basically was everything but the alkaloids, with no effects, but a slight headache and weariness that ebbed away after an hour. On the other hand, the sulfate containing all the isolated alkaloids together in a dose equivalent to 16.67 grams of the cactus, did produce again some visions. Now, Hefter had to single out which one of the alkaloids played the leading role. He started with a dose of 0.15 gram mescaline hydrochloride. After two hours, Hefter reported violet and green stains that showed up, up on the paper while reading and sometimes later he had visions of landscapes, halls and architecture. Now for the sake of completeness, he then went on to test analonidine and analonin on himself without any effect. Lufophorin only had mild sedative effects. Thus there was no doubt that it was the mescaline which exclusively caused the characteristic symptoms of a mescal intoxication and above all that it solely induced the yet unprecedented visions. Now, taking all of this into account, it may be argued that mescaline was actually discovered three times by Hefter. First, materially, as a loosely identified alkaloid, then molecularly, as a chemical formula, and finally, experimentally, as a vision-inducing ingredient of the peyote cactus. Last but not least, Hefter predicted that thankful opportunities would lie ahead for, 
physiologists and experimental psychologists, which actually turned out to be true. Of course, after Hefter's seminal work on mescaline, one puzzle piece that was still missing was the structural elucidation and chemical synthesis of mescaline. And it actually took more than two decades until this was achieved by another famous chemist, Ernst Spät, who at that time was a chemistry professor at the University of Vienna. Spät's seminal paper from 1919 is really worth a read. In his paper, Spät actually um, starts off with the recapitulation of Hefter's work, who determined the correct stoichiometric formula for mescaline and for which Hefter had postulated the following constitution. Now, Spät reasoned that provided that Hefter's stoichiometric formula for mescaline was correct, there would be two additional potential constitutions. And of course, the question now was which of the three would be the right one? Spät argued that at that po point in time, no natural alkaloid of a benzyl amine type had been reported, whereas alpha phenyl beta amino ethane derivatives were already known to be very common. Now, to verify his hypothesis that mescaline is indeed 3,4,5-trimethoxyphenylethylamine, he went ahead and synthesized it. Spät's synthesis started with gallic acid, which after permethylation, using dimethyl sulfide and saponification of the methyl ester, he transferred into the acid chloride through treatment with phosphorus pentachloride. He then reduced the acid chloride to the corresponding aldehyde using a Rosenmund reduction and condensed the aldehyde with nitromethane in a Henry reaction, yielding the beta nitro 345 trimethoxystyrene. So already at that point, two interesting name reactions in the sequence, and I will probably um, produce another video where I go into the detail for these name reactions. Next, uh, Spät reduced the nitro group to the oxime using classic reductive conditions with zinc dust and acetic acid, and finally, this was reduced to the mescaline by sodium amalgam. Finally, in order to prove that his hypothesis was right, um, Spät compared the melting points of several salts of phenylethylamine that he had obtained with that of the corresponding salts of natural mescaline, and they were pretty spot on. So for that time, this was really a masterpiece, and um, the fact that um, Spät had obtained 14.5 grams of fully synthetic mescaline is quite astonishing. As a matter of fact, um, Spät's synthesis was the basis for many more syntheses to follow. With that being said, let's have a look at some other classic mescaline synthesis that came after Spät's groundbreaking work. In 1930, Slaughter and Heller reported as part of a pioneering study of the structure activity relationship of mescaline an alternative synthesis route. They first prepared the same aldehyde that Spät had used and transformed it into the corresponding cinnamic acid through a so called Knövenagel Döpner reaction. Maybe I will do a separate video on that name reaction, but the main difference to the classic Knövenagel reaction is the use of a diacid instead of a diethyl melonate. Now the alpha beta unsorted system was reduced, the carboxylic acid transformed to the primary amide, and finally, through the clever use of a Hoffman rearrangement, they obtained 29 gram of mescaline. One year later, Kindler and um, Peschke prepared N-benzoyl beta benzoyl um, oxymescaline from 345-trimethoxybenzaldehyde. Uh, uh, and they used it to obtain uh, N-benzoyl mescaline in an earlier example of a transfer hydrogenation by heating the benzyl oxy compound in tetraline with finely uh, divided um, palladium, followed by uh, basic hydrolysis to afford mescaline. Unsatisfied with this method, Kindler and Peschke actually developed another art which they considered much more practical and efficient. Again, starting from the notorious aldehyde, they first prepared the bisulfide adduct of the aldehyde. The sulfide moiety was substituted by cyanide. Then acetylation of the hydroxyl group and catalytic hydrogenation in a strongly acidic medium yielded mescaline. In an attempt to address some of the low yielding steps in previous synthesis, in 1934, Hahn and Wasmuth reported quite a creative synthesis route, leveraging elemicine as a starting point. Of course, this itself had to be synthesized, so Hahn and Wasmuth started from trimethoxy gallic acid, which was selectively demethylated to syringic acid using concentrated sulfuric acid. Methylation and alkylation of the free phenyl 
yielded the one allyl pyrogallol 35 dimethyl ether, which was ready for a glazing rearrangement, followed by a cope rearrangement to afford elimitine. So again, quite an interesting step, and I will follow up with another video. The letter was um, subject to uh, ozonolysis, the aldehyde captured as a bisulfide adduct and transferred into the oxime, and finally transformed into the nitrile, which was reduced to the primary amine yielding mescaline. Finally, in 1951, Bennington and Morin reported on an improved synthesis of mescaline following pretty much Spät's route, but using lithium aluminum hydride for the final reduction with apparently overall better yield. Additional um, syntheses of mescaline were reported in subsequent years, but showcasing more certain methodologies rather than trying to further improve mescaline synthesis, so I will not cover them in this video. I want to switch gears now and end with some background on mescaline's psychoactive properties and potential therapeutic use. Unfortunately, compared to other psychedelics, studies on mescaline have been somewhat limited, but it is known that mescaline is a agonist for the 5-hydroxytryptamine or serotonin receptors. These are GPCR, so G-protein coupled receptors that can be divided to seven families. When comparing mescaline with other phenylethylamines and tryptamine hallucinogens, mescaline has relatively moderate affinities towards serotonin receptors. You can see from the table that mescaline is a serotonin 2A and C receptor agonist. The main hallucinogenic effects are exerted via the 5H22A receptor agonism. Besides that, mescaline also binds with low micromolar affinity to the serotonin 1A and 2B receptors. Other than that, mescaline shows low affinities to adrenergic and dopamine receptors. The lower affinity towards serotonin receptors is consistent with the need for a higher dose to achieve full psychedelic effects in humans. You can see from this table that LSD and psilocybin are much more potent on the 5H22A receptor. In terms of ATME, mescaline is rapidly absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, but a great percentage of the dose of mescaline is actually distributed to kidneys and the liver, delaying its concentration in blood, increasing its half-life, and delaying the occurrence of effects. After mescaline ingestion, the psychedelic peak effect usually occurs after 2 hours and disappears after 10 to 12 hours. The half-life of mescaline in humans is about 6 hours around 81% of mescaline is excreted unchanged into the urine. Regarding mescaline's therapeutic potentials, there's much less data than for other psychedelics, let alone clinical studies. However, recent epidemiological studies support anecdotal reports and preliminary research conducted in the early 1900s. For instance, Argin Diebes et al. in 2021 conducted an epidemiological study with samples of 452 adults who completed an anonymous survey regarding their recreational use of mescaline. The results indicate that mescaline administration is associated with improvements in general mental health and well-being, addressing issues such as anxiety, substance use disorder, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Most of the subjects with histories of these disorders reported improvement in their condition. Significant subjective improvements were reported in participants with histories of depression, alcohol use disorder, and drug use disorder. This data, although of limited value, points to the notion that mescaline could have therapeutic properties worth investigating further. More research, especially controlled randomized double-blind uh, clinical trials, is needed to determine its clinical efficacy and to determine where to place mescaline regarding its suitability for employment in therapies aimed at treating various psychiatric disorders. Finally, for all of you who want to learn more about the really exciting field of psychedelics, I can highly recommend the book How to Change Your Mind from Mike Lepolen. You can find a link in the description below. And for those of you who rather want to watch a documentary, um, you can also find uh, a documentary on Netflix called Fendere Dein Bewusstsein or How to Change Your Mind, pretty much covering some of the uh, contents of Michael Pollan's book. Thank you very much for watching and I would really appreciate if you give me a thumbs up for this video and of course if you subscribe to this channel.